Okay, hi everybody. So in this Screencastify, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about Act 3, Scene 1 soliloquy from Macbeth. So in this soliloquy, we start to see a really different side to Macbeth. Um, before he's been seen as quite um, cautious, um, uh, but quite cowardly in the eyes of Lady Macbeth, or even as a brave warrior in Act One, Scene Two. But now we, now that he's become king, um, he starts to become much more ruthless, and his ambition becomes much more apparent. So I'm going to talk you through each bit of the um, uh, soliloquy, and if you've got your copy there with you, if you can just annotate along with me. So the first thing he says is, "To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus." So he says. I've got to this position, but it's meaningless unless I am safe. So he wants to be safe in his um, in his uh, position as king. He then goes on to pinpoint what it is that is worrying him. And he says, our fears in Banquo stick deep. Now, the reason that he fears Banquo is because, of course, Banquo had the prophecies in Act 1, Scene 2. Okay, so although... Uh, Excuse my spelling. Although Banquo hasn't acted on the prophecies, he had those prophecies that his sons would become king. He then starts to list some of the characteristics of Banquo that are particularly troubling to him. He says he has this royalty of nature. So he has this naturally royal nature that is, excuse my spelling on this, there was going to be a few typos. So he has this naturally uh, royal nature um, which uh, almost means he has this kingly kind of character. So he's got it in him already to be um, he to be a monarch or his sons to be like kings. He says, "'Tis much he dares unto that dauntless temper of his mind." So here we're going to look at the word dares and dauntless. Have a think about what characteristic that might be of, of Banquo. If he's dauntless and if he dares. So label this, he's brave and he is bold, which is a characteristic that Macbeth finds um, threatening. But he says he's not just brave, he's careful, he's not careless, he's not reckless, he has a wisdom. Although he's brave, he won't just act, he will think very carefully about things. So someone who is wise, perhaps, Macbeth thinks that it's someone who could potentially figure him out um, and uh, understand his true motives. There is none but he who's been I do fear, and under him my genius is rebuked, as it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. So he gives the example there of a, a great leader being undermined by someone who uh, is beneath them. And he says, there's no one else I fear other than Banquo. Then he thinks back to Act 1, Scene 2, and he reflects, well, actually, you know, in Act 1, Scene 2, in when we went in when we met the witches, um, he asked them to speak to him. So he thinks back to the witches and he says, Come to think of it, if Banquo seemed very keen to know more about um the prophecies, so maybe he's got the same ambition as me. He said, Well, they bade them speak to him. So maybe he maybe he wanted to know, you know, he starts to become quite paranoid and suspicious of someone who was previously his friend. So can you label his growing paranoia? He starts to get paranoid. They hailed him father to a line of kings and we get quite an important metaphor here of a fruitless crown and a barren scepter. So he imagines here that everything he's done has been done for nothing. He's got blood on his hands, Duncan's blood on his hands, but all, all of this murder and all of these, um, the sin that he's committed has been just to make the sons of Banquo king. 
He says his crown is fruitless, which means that he's not able to produce any more kings. If this is going to be the, um, the extent of his power, then it feels like a waste to him. So he's powerless. He's almost impotent. He can't produce any more kings. He says the barren scepter in his grip. Now, the scepter is that sort of long stick with this sort of orb at the top that um, kings would hold, a symbol of their power. And he says, well, it, it's barren, you know, it's pointless. It can't, it can't produce any more kings. Um, he says that it's wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeed him. So he s imagines his sons not being able to follow um, and become king after him, which for him, it makes the whole situation pointless. If it be so, for Banquo's issue, have I filed my mind? He says it was for Banquo's sons that he has sinned. Now that is... Uh, unthinkable to him you know that oh, look <laughs> type that in there okay so it was um the idea of him sinning simply for Banquo's sons to become king after him means that the whole the whole activity was pointless he has sinned he has um given away essentially his soul he sold his soul to the devil and committed an eternal sin and condemned himself to hell for um for nothing he says he's put rankers in the vessels vessel of my peace and given mine eternal jewel to the common enemy of man. Now, the common enemy of man here is the devil. He sold his soul to the devil um, and destroyed his own soul and his humanity for Banquo's sons to become king. So he's he's horrified by this and he realizes something has to be done about it. Uh, the devil sold his soul. Okay, that's not correct, but you know what I mean. It should mean that the devil has his soul. He sold his soul to the devil. And look at these exclamations as well. He's He said to make them kings, the seed of Banquo kings. So we've got exclamations and some repetition to show his horror uh, at the, the the idea that they will become kings and essentially um, sort of um, cancel out everything that he's done. Then he says, rather than so, come fate into the list and champion me to the utterance. So there he says, rather than let this happen, he must take action. Now, this was a Macbeth who earlier in the play decided that it was going to be better if he waited simply for things to happen if chance may crown me chance chance may crown me king basically that he would wait and see and allow fate to take control but we know Macbeth isn't like that in act one scene two Macbeth said that he would in, well, they were in act one scene two they they spoke about Macbeth saying he carved out his passage um, he had these black and deep desires, this vaulting ambition that he wanted to act on. Here, he stops equivocating, trying to let fate take control of his decision. And he says, right, I've got to take action on this. There is no one who I fear more than Banquo. And he um, does not deliberate he does not, he starts, well, he, he doesn't deliberate over the death of Banquo later in this act. He, he says that it must go ahead without question.